Recently, a current sophomore at the college I went to reached out to me on LinkedIn. He said he was trying to compile a history of the comedy scene at our school and asked if he could interview me. I thought it was kind of weird and adorable, and I agreed. But when we got on Zoom, it was clear that he didn't want to interview me about the comedy scene. He had examined my profile, and he wanted career advice. He wanted guidance about what pursuing theater and comedy really means. This was much more interesting to me, and I talked to him for two hours. I remembered being 19 and desperately needing someone to tell me what to do, what to expect. I was a theater major in college, and it seemed to be preparing me for a career in professional theater. As the stress of graduation loomed, people kept telling me, it's OK to be uncertain. Most people end up doing something that has nothing to do with what they majored in anyway. <laughs> this did not help. I wanted a career in the exact thing I majored in theater with a focus in directing and also an intense passion for improv. And the supposed reassurances made me feel like all these people, especially my parents, doubted that I could do it. I was determined to prove that I could turn these things into a career, and I knew that I had to start right away. I moved to Chicago two weeks after graduation with basically no plan except an unpaid internship at a children's theater. I showed up on a Van Gelder coach bus from Madison, Wisconsin, and I didn't have a smartphone yet or even a map just a piece of paper where I'd written the names of train lines and stops I needed to get to. The directions made sense while I was looking at Google Maps at home and were totally inscrutable when I was out there in the real world. The bus rolled into downtown Chicago at 5 p.m. on a Friday, just as everyone was getting off work, trudging toward the trains and their business casuals. I've made it, I thought to myself, as I looked at everyone hustling and bustling around like I was Mary Tyler Moore about to throw her hat. <laughs> And then I walked in the wrong direction about seven times before I found the right train. In fact, those first few weeks were full of missteps. The children's theater didn't seem to know what to do with an intern, and the gig fizzled out quickly. My housing fell through while I was still crashing on a couch, and I had to scramble to find a fast summer sublet in like 48 hours. Once I found one, with some college freshmen, my only semblance of a social life was tagging along to the frat house where they liked to hang out. I immediately fell in love with Chicago. I felt a sense of potential. But I didn't have any friends or creative projects yet. I wasn't sure what to do. It was a sad summer. I'd romanticized the move, the idea of living in a big city and chasing my dreams so much that I hadn't thought through all the other things that make up life. And not only did the world of Chicago theater feel confusing and inaccessible, I was also basically unemployed. I knew that I didn't want to work an office job because it would get in the way of my big, important art career whenever I figured out what that meant. I had to have money, though, so I'd take the train to different neighborhoods, and I'd walk into businesses, and I'd hand them my resume. I answered dozens of weird ads on Craigslist. I had no idea what I was even looking for, but I knew it should be extremely temporary because I needed to focus on my art. And that's how I ended up with a part-time job as one of those people who takes your photo at Navy Pier and tries to sell it back to you. <laughs> it was as bad as you think. And a second one in the rentals department of a year-round Halloween store, which was awesome at first, and then it was worse than you'd expect. <laughs> and then when I wanted to leave the photo gig, I responded to a Craigslist ad where a chiropractor wanted someone to do promotional events at gyms and health facilities. I thought, Promotional events, that's the kind of job actors have. <laughs> Perfect. So I went to these events at every gym in the neighborhood surrounding the clinic, which was nicknamed the Viagra Triangle, <laughs> because it was full of bars where old men went to hit on young women. <laughs> it was my job to offer posture checks and foot scans to people in order to entice them to go to the chiropractor. Unfortunately, sometimes it was also my job to offer five-minute massages. <laughs> I'd ask sweaty people mid-workout if they wanted a massage. Unfortunately, most of them thought it was weird and said no. But some guys, always guys, would take me up on it, and then they'd ask, so are you a professional masseuse? And I am too honest, and I would tell them no. <sighs> but I was a theater major, so those massage trains had to count for something, right? <laughs> I endured these jobs, thinking, this is all temporary until I figure out my career. I was, let's just say, incorrect about that timeline. 
But in the meantime, I took improv classes and performed on teams. I created a theater company with my friends, and we created original shows that whole tens of people came to see. <laughs> it wasn't the former, formal theater career my university had prepared me for, but I was doing what I set out to do. I was directing plays. I was performing. After a couple years of weird jobs, I started working at a law firm. My parents were so thrilled. <laughs> They peppered me with questions about how the phone system worked, a curiosity they never shared about my creative work. I established something that resembled a regular life, one that paid the bills while I spent every night doing improv in basements. I developed a solid circle of friends and a long list of favorite restaurants, but it didn't feel like enough to me. I was anxious all the time that I wasn't good enough, wasn't funny enough. I didn't feel like I had proven I belonged on this career path, and it felt like nothing was happening fast enough. So I decided to move. I moved to LA because I wanted to write for TV, and I thought, that's where the jobs are, so many jobs. <laughs> Which is technically true, I guess. But really, it was because at my core, I wasn't satisfied with the day-to-day -day life I'd built in Chicago or within myself. And I felt like the problem was that there must be more somewhere else. So I saved money and I made a plan and departed for LA when I was 25. I was almost embarrassed to be gambling on myself so hard that I was moving across the country for it. I was doing all this because I believed in myself. That felt wrong. <laughs> I was desperate to prove myself, to validate my ambitions, but I had no idea where to start. And naturally, when I got here, I was unemployed. I spent a couple months that way, living in Pasadena with a high school friend and interviewing for lots of weird jobs, deja vu. I was homesick. I missed the skyline and the array of local beers and most of all, my friends. Finally, I landed a full-time job at a company called Captain Marketing. It was a shady SEO company and I got paid $12 an hour to write blog posts to trip Google searches with particular keywords. The workday was eight hours, and we were supposed to finish at least 16 blog posts a day. Posing as experts on topics ranging from ornate knives to military-grade rubber to mental health. <laughs> I had ethical concerns about the last one. Their whole deal was that they had tons of clients all over the country, and they did terrible work for all of them. But that didn't matter, because their biggest salesman, this middle-aged white man, spent all day on the phone loudly cold-calling business owners in earshot of everyone else in the office. He told every single person that answered that he was in SAG. <laughs> and I once heard him brag about being in New York on 9-11 within the first 15 seconds of a cold call. <laughs> Aside from him, nobody actually seemed to be working. <laughs> One girl fell asleep at her desk every day, in plain sight in our open office plan, if you can call it that, nobody else seemed to notice. After a few days of doing this job, I was truly losing my mind. I would write these awful articles all day and then go home at night and spiral, wondering why I'd wanted to give up my nice little law job with its benefits and its catered lunches. On the Thursday of the third week, in my blog research, I discovered that there was a Jimmy John's in Pasadena. I'd been craving it since leaving the Midwest. And I spent the rest of the day looking forward to going home and ordering a turkey tom sandwich for dinner. When I got home and poured myself my nightly glass of whiskey, <laughs> Captain Marketing was not good for me. I called Jimmy John's to place the order. The shop was 1.2 miles away, and they told me I was outside their delivery radius. I was furious. What was the suburban hell I was living in? Why had I left walkable Chicago for this? I needed the sandwich. So I decided to walk to Jimmy John's. Which, like, 1.2 miles is a regular walk. But it was more than that. I felt wronged. <laughs> by Pasadena, by idyllic, beautiful sprawl, by my own decision to uproot my life and chase a dream that felt so very far away, this wasn't just a walk. It was a vendetta. <laughs> What's so special about a turkey tom sandwich? Absolutely nothing. It is a regular turkey sandwich. Turkey, <laughs> lettuce, tomato, mayo, end of list. <laughs> but it felt like home. It felt like the thing that was missing. So I marched myself toward Jimmy John's, and I live tweeted the experience with the hashtag sandwich quest. <laughs> 
I was on a mission. And as I tweeted my walk, I had to observe my surroundings. These wide, incredibly green suburban streets and enormous highway overpasses. I started noticing interesting succulents I'd never paid attention to before and tiny lizards. I took photos. I wrote jokes. I let myself be entertained by my own journey. I got my sandwich and I quit that job the next day. In a few more weeks, I found a job at a law firm and I was basically right back where I started, except somewhere new. I wanted something to make sense. I wanted my career, my sense of purpose to be validated. 10 years later and I still want that. But career validation is a bottomless pit and nothing will ever fill it. The most exciting accomplishments wither away and feel like nothing when you look back at them weeks or months later while you're waiting for the next dopamine hit that will surely finally tell you you were good and okay. In reality, it's life that needs to feel like enough to get out of bed every day, no matter how everything else is going. And it took over a decade for me to accept that. So when I told the college sophomore, don't feel like you have to be good to be successful right away, I meant it. There is no rush. Despite my best efforts, my life since college has been one long sandwich quest. <laughs> And it's infinitely better when I'm appreciating the walk because it turns out the sandwiches are incredibly fleeting. Thank you. Please keep it going for Julie Pearson. Julie is a writer, director, and the co-host of the non-fiction show, a variety show in Atwater Village where you can catch her reading every month. Give it up one more time for Julie. <laughs> 